Right. Chris from the Netherlands, welcome. Zahir from Palestine, fantastic. Got Hawaii in the house, excellent. Mm. More from the Netherlands, fantastic. We were just saying, you Netherlands people, how you're pushing the envelope on this alternate assessment stuff. Good, Great we have, to have some you joining with us. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll let people continue to roll on in. So today's webinar is Alternative Assessment in Digital Learning and Higher Education from Global Perspectives. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. As we go through, if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. If there's a question that we feel like we need to address, our moderator will jump in and handle that. We'll post a link to the slides so you can download that and follow along. And we are recording this and we'll make it available to you as soon as we can. Captions are also available if you'd like to access those. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. That hashtag is WCET webcast. Thank you so much to our partner, 1HE. They've introduced us to our wonderful panelists today, so we're very grateful for the partnership. Vitac is our partner for captions. And again, any questions, please do enter them into the Q&A. If they get put in chat, we often lose them, so we wanna make sure that we can wrangle all those questions via the Q&A. We have a wonderful moderator today. She's on the WCET steering committee and is a very cherished member. Janelle Elias is the interim vice president for strategic initiatives at the national division at Rio Salado College. Janelle is a chief strategy officer with over 20 years experience in online learning. She started when she was just barely 10, I'm sure of it. Elias serves on the president's executive team at Rio Salado, which is a pioneer in distance education and has a national and global reach. She provides leadership for strategic planning, institutional research, compliance and accreditation, conduct and community standards, disability services, marketing, development, strategic partners, partnerships at the national division. But before I hand it over to Janelle, I'd like us all to just take a moment to reflect. WCT is based in Boulder, Colorado. And we were faced with tragedy yesterday. So I'd like us all just to take a moment to think about those that you love and cherish very much. Thank you. Now I'd like to go ahead and let Janelle take it over. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you this afternoon. So good afternoon, good evening, or even good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Janelle Elias, and as a member of the WCET Steering Committee, I have the, dist the distinct pleasure of welcoming you to the webcast and introducing you to our panelists. Let me say you are in for a treat today as WCET and 1HE have lined up global experts on alternative assessment. Our panelists bring deep expertise as pioneers, researchers, and practitioners who are widely published in the field. Today's three presenters will focus on e-portfolios, self and peer assessment, formative assessment, and the use of educational technology in assessment. My role will be to facilitate the Q&A panel, so please add your questions and use this opportunity to engage with our experts. We will open discussion after a brief presentation. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panelists who will introduce themselves in order of appearance. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm David Hubert. Uh, I've been at Salt Lake Community College for 27 years as a political science faculty member, as a director of our faculty teaching and learning center, and now as associate provost for learning advancement. Thanks, David. Good. Morning, everyone. I'm coming in from Melbourne, Australia. Really my pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Chie Dachi, and I wear actually two hats at the university. I'm one as an associate professor. And so in this regard, I'm a teacher and a researcher. 
I'm also the course director for our master's and graduate certificate of digital learning leadership at the university. And I also wear the other hat as director of digital learning for the university. So I head up a team of learning designers, learning technologists that work on a number of innovation projects at the university. Lovely to be here with you again. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Tia. Um, my name's Steve, Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology from the University of Toronto in Canada, where it is afternoon. <laughs> We've spanned the time zones. Um, yeah, in addition to teaching psychology, both at U of T and at Coursera.org, um, I am also director of our Advanced Learning Technologies Lab, where we uh, do research on educational technologies, but also create some ourselves. Um, I lead a sort of parallel life to Chia, which is kind of interesting. We're, we're like similar people on opposite sides of the planet. <laughs> so um, I really look forward to presenting both with David and Chia today. And I'm just gonna turn it over to David to get things started. Okay, thank you, Steve. Well, uh, I have a, about 10 minutes. I want to tell you the story of ePortfolios at Salt Lake Community College. We've had a large implementation of ePortfolio in our general education program for 11 years now. So we have quite a bit of experience with it. Since it is anchored in our general education program, it touches almost all of our students. It's not a graduation requirement, but it is a common pedagogy throughout our general education program. All general education courses need to identify at least one, what we call a signature assignment and have students put that in their ePortfolio to represent the course along with at least one uh, reflection. Now the signature assignments have to be real world demonstrations of knowledge. So not quizzes or tests, but papers, presentations, uh, um, art projects, things like that. Uh, and they have to touch two or more of the general education learning outcomes. So critical thinking, effective communication, quantitative literacy, and that's all up to the instructor. We encourage faculty to identify more than one signature assignment so that students have the ability to curate their ePortfolio and decide for themselves what to put in the portfolio for their class, for that particular class. And when it comes to reflection, we suggest that faculty ask uh, students a variety of reflection prompts, again, so that students could choose what to put in their portfolio as their final reflection. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. This is how we conceptualize uh, an ePortfolio. It's a hub that contains uh, lots of goodies from the point of view of a student. So you can see the signature assignments there and the reflection. Um, but students can also put co-curricular activities in there, um, club activities, sports, um, study abroad. They put their goals in there and we suggest that they frequently update their goals. They can do self-assessment uh, and that's something that we've really tried to stress. We're really by anchoring it in our general education program, our ePortfolio is designed to help students become reflective practitioners regardless of what major they choose. And that's really one of our goals. And then of course, the signature assignments are key to learning outcomes. So we're hoping that students become more intentional about achieving those learning outcomes in our general education program. And if we go to the next slide, this is what we think comes out of an ePortfolio. Um, everything from intentionality, as I mentioned, the, the notion of becoming a reflective practitioner, developing a scholarly identity. Uh, it's a tool for applying for scholarships and transfer. It's a showcase of students' engagement in our general education program. It demonstrates educational coherence, uh, and the unique journey that each student uh, has taken through our general education program. Now, let me pause here for a minute and, and go over a little bit of history. Back in 2004, a predecessor in my position and a number of faculty, and I was one of those faculty, we were quite concerned that our general education program, because it was menu driven, students were experiencing it as one unrelated course after another that they figure they had to take 
before they could get into their major. And there was no real cohesion, no integration there. And we were quite concerned about that. At the same time, uh, we had a visit from our regional accreditor who wasn't concerned so much about that as an issue, but they were concerned that at the time the college was not assessing its general education program in any meaningful way. So we sort of piggyback those two problems together, the lack of integration and, and coherence in our general education program with the fact that we weren't assessing it. And at that time we received a, a small grant and we started piloting e-portfolios. And I was in the faculty cohort that, were, that started piloting e-portfolios in our classes. And after three years, we decided to put forth a proposal to, to marry all of this together uh, and use ePortfolio as a common pedagogy in all general education courses with this idea of signature assignments and reflection. A, because it integrates and makes intentional our general education program, and B, it provides us a platform to assess uh, the program. And so we did that, and, and when our accreditor came back 10 years later, we actually received a commendation for the way that we assess our general education program. And I must say that, that we really have a, a, an, a tremendous insight into how students are actually experiencing general education. You think you know when you design a program how students experience it because you've controlled all the inputs, right? But until you can see students uh, demonstrate their learning with signature assignments and their reflection, you don't really have a full understanding. Uh, let's go to that, the final slide now. So we're very intentional about closing the loop on assessment. If we start at the top there, um, every year institutional research grabs a sample of graduating students. These are students who completed all of their general education program with us. So we weed out the students who transferred in for assessment purposes. And then our ePortfolio office organizes an assessment of these ePortfolios. And we have created a large rubric that's basically, we have cobbled together AAC new value rubrics, um, rubrics that we've developed on our own, uh, rubrics that we've developed from other places and modified. And then uh, we have teams of faculty who are assigned a portion of the rubric, so assigned certain learning outcomes. And each team does a norming session, and then they review all of the ePortfolios. And the ePortfolio office writes a report which is submitted to the college community, particularly the general education committee, committee and the academic departments. And through that, we have uh, demonstrably improved teaching and learning in a number of sections of our general education program. And then each year we do this. So we're getting an annual look at our, e at our general education program and students' experience in it. And then finally, uh, I will say that one of the unexpected benefits of the ePortfolio is that students are starting to appreciate the ability to do self-assessment. Uh, they're seeing themselves develop over time, even though they're only with us for, for you know, two years, uh, they can see their progress over time. And that's been very gratifying. And so now I'll turn it over to Jay. Dave, before we move on, David, oh. can you um, actually address the question, which ePortfolio platform are you using and or which would you recommend from your experience? Thank you. So when we started this, we were having some budget difficulties because of the great recession. Uh, and so we opted not to choose a particular platform and we allowed students to create in any platform. The most common ones were uh, Weebly, WordPress, Wix, things like that. And we developed a system so that regardless of the platform, we could associate it with the student's name in the class role. So it's quite easy for the faculty member to get to that. Um, that worked for a while. It had some shortcomings. Uh, we are now use Digication, uh, which is a, a platform that was originally developed at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful for us. There are a number of other platforms out there um, that we looked at and that were quite strong, but we happened to pick Digication. Thank you for clarifying. Sure. Dr. Adachi? 
Thank you very much, David and Janelle. It's interesting, isn't it? There's lots of overlapping areas of thinking, I think, in terms of pedagogy across portfolio and what I'm going to talk about, which is self and peer assessment. Um, but just for the record, we just landed on PebblePad as an e-portfolio tool for the university recently. So that's another one that's quite big in Australia at the moment. So today I wanted to talk to you about self and peer assessment as an, another form for alternative assessment. And this is something that I have worked on over the years through practice and research. So in getting us started, I would like to first and foremost acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm beaming in from as we gather for this webinar, physically dispersed and virtually constructed. Let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place and in doing so, recognize the various traditional lands across the globe that we do our business today. And I acknowledge and pay my respect to the elders past and present of the land that we work and live on and their ancestral spirit with gratitude and respect. In my case, it's the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation in the east side of Melbourne. So why do we care about self and peer assessment? And it is because of all these reasons that David was also talking about. It's that idea of developing transferable or 21st century skill sets. So things like critical thinking, communication skills, digital literacy and fluency, these are the kind of things that we have the opportunity to develop in our students through this form of assessment. In particular though, this notion of evaluative judgment, the next slide please, Janelle, um, is the capability to make decisions about the quality of work of self and others. And this is really important, especially in this increasingly disrupted and digital world that we live in, this idea of capability to evaluate our own work and others is really important because there's a world full of information and to be able to disseminate from what's fake news to the real and what's good quality of work looks like is a really, really important capability. And so just to set the scene in terms of what self MP assessment is, uh, I use assessment as a very broad term. So things like judgment or evaluation or review, uh, I include those in terms of assessment as an umbrella term. So in the case of self-assessment, students judge their own work, make decisions about their own work against certain criteria and peer assessment is similar that they do among themselves around their peers work. So my story with self and peer assessment is actually twofold through with practice and research. That's the next slide, thank you. Um, and so I have done some research with um, Research Center and then I worked on a project at the university. So just to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about the project at the university. Next slide, please. Yes, so this is something that I've led at the university since 2015. And it was also to do with recognizing this varied and good practice around self and peer assessment that has been already happening at the university. It is not by any means a new type of assessment. So there are already lots of practices happening. But also we set out to look for technological solutions in which we can do this self and peer assessment online at scale. So through this six or so years, we have gone through iterations of technologies and understanding our practices a lot better at deeper level. So through the lens of research, um, I have done quite a lot of research with Cradle, our research center, Center for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning at Deakin. And I have published quite a bit. So if you look at look um, my record online, you would probably be able to find uh, published pieces around that. So what did we find through this research in terms of the opportunities with self and peer assessment? Here's what we found. And there are seven key themes that we found through the empirical research in interviewing academics and synthesizing the existing literature. So as I said, it is mostly to do with the development of transferable or 21st century uh, skills. 
And it really makes this authentic, uh, assessment to be authentic in cultivating students who will be work ready and lifelong learners because it cultivates those critical learning outcomes into the digital world that they would be moving on to. And it really activates the learning because it gives the power over to the students to be the assessors rather than the traditional the assessed. Students get to exercise that power in evaluating their and their peers' work. And it also engages students to understand the standards and assessment criteria better. Often teachers create their rubrics, but not engage students in dissecting that rubric or assessment criteria. But because students actually suddenly need to evaluate their own work or their peers' work, they really need to understand what that standard means to them. So that's a learning opportunity. And in thinking about the feedback also, it could be timely, varied, because there are lots of different types of students in a group, for example, and appropriate feedback among students, especially in the case of teamwork, for example, where teachers won't be able to work with the teams or the groups in a regular manner, students themselves are well situated to give each other feedback. So that's the notion of feedback. And of course, there's a lot of skill sets to be able to give and receive constructive and compassionate feedback. And there's a, those sorts of uh, skill sets that we can develop through self MP assessment. Last but not least, and this needs to be framed carefully, when designed well or when done right, this form of assessment, self MP assessment, can get less input and time or resources required of teachers because students become their self-regulated learners and assessors to do this exercise themselves. So it takes a bit of a practice and time to refine it, but when done well, it could save some of teachers' time and input. What about the opposite side of the coin? Challenges with self and peer assessment, and this is what we found as key themes. So reliability and accuracy of students' judgment skills, there's a fair bit of anxiety attached from teachers' perspective in regards to the perceived expertise of the students. Because in a disciplinary area, students are often seen as novices of that particular subject. So students, uh, teachers have a bit of uh, anxiety in passing over that power to the students to do that. But scaffolding the exercise actually uh, reveals that students do become uh, adequate and accurate assessors through practice. And also in the case of teamwork, again, students are the appropriate assessors. So there are areas and ways in which we can develop students to be um, good assessors of their and then their peers work. Power relations. This is something that's common in a group teamwork environment. Um, there is a difference between student capabilities and so forth. And so teachers need to be ready to guide students in resolving conflicts when they arise and creating these safe learning environments in which self and peer assessment can occur. Last but not least, time and resource constraints. And this is not particular to self and peer assessment. I think all our academics in academia are often at best of times under pressure with time and uh, resources. Um, but with something like self and peer assessment, especially teachers are doing it for the first time, we need to allocate enough time and resources to help teachers in designing and implementing self and peer assessment well. And of course, we are now saying, join us online because everything happens <laughs> through technology and to be able to scale and facilitate this uh, process of self and peer assessment, we need to really carefully think and evaluate and select technology as well. And I think Steve is gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I'll leave it at that. So what can you do about it? And we've done uh, what we call Cradle Suggest series. It's a one page, uh, very practical and succinct strategies in which teachers can uh, implement. And here are the six things that we are recommending. Be explicit about the why and the value of self and peer assessment to students and scaffold the experience so that it will be over multiple of time. And it's actually something that teachers, uh, students can 
practice their skill in doing self-assessment. Consult widely, and it could be involving students in the process, in co-constructing co rubric, for example, or talk to IT professionals in doing it online, or other colleagues who have done this well in the past. And reimagine resources, again, going back to how busy and under-resourced our academics are, do think about where you need to invest your time and we allocate time and resources accordingly. And this start and small and simple is my favorite. And I'm a big fan of James Lang's book, Small Teaching. But if you're doing something for the first time, especially pick a unit that's smaller cohort, if possible, or pick a formative assessment rather than high stake, big exam time assessment to be self and peer assessment. So start small and simple. And with the view of iterations for long-term benefits, things can get refined with any educational endeavors that you do over time and multiple times. Finally, this is a bit of a self-promoting uh, plug. Um, I have done this at work with One HE and created this resource that is micro-learning for teachers. And it's 20 minutes course that unpacks our research and recommending some strategies that are practical and easy to implement in designing an assessment, self and peer assessment uh, for a digital world. So thank you very much for lending your ears to listen to me and I'll pass over to Steve. Excellent. Thank you uh, both David and Chi. And, and let, let me just start by saying, you know, to all the, the WC ET folks there in, in Boulder, we are all thinking about you. We're all are grieving with you. Um, it's horrible. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to largely take over sort of where Chi left off a little bit because again, we are both big believers in, in this what we call formative peer assessment process. I want to highlight this point first. One of the reasons you know I'm so passionate about this is because these alternate this alternate form of assessment not only deepens students' knowledge by having them work with what they're learning but they also engage in quality-based discrimination as, as she was talking about, you know, trying to figure out what's better than what and why. And so they exercise their critical thinking, they exercise their creative thinking, they exercise their communication skills and skills only develop with use. Uh, so they have to actually use them in order to get better. And preferably we want them to get a very structured experience and a lot of repetition. You know, think about learning any athletic uh, sport or, or a musical instrument. You get better by having repeated structured practice. And so one of the exciting things about formative peer assessment as an alternative assessment strategy is it allows you to give students that practice uh, in ways that fit within the constraints of our educational realities. So uh, yeah, we'll go to the next slide there, sorry. I tried to advance myself. Um, so, so let me, I'm gonna focus on now this role that technology can play uh, in terms of sort of amping up the pedagogical benefit. I'm gonna talk from the perspective of something called Peer Scholar, which is a technology that came out of our lab. It's the technology I know best. Um, so I'll be talking about it. Uh, if you wanna know more, peerscholar.com will give you more information, but also be aware that there are now quite a few products out there. It is still a maturing uh, market, but, but you have a lot of choice when it comes to peer assessment technologies. You can choose you know, the best, ours or something else, uh, up to you. <laughs> Just kidding. Moving on um, to the next slide to, to hype why the technology. I want to start just by being super clear because sometimes when we talk about things, it's a, it's a little ambiguous. So the sort of process that she and I were talking about and that can actually feed into the digital portfolios that David is talking about kind of goes like this, just to be explicit. Usually we ask students to create something and, and this is, the professor already has a lot of expertise in this, right? Something that they think is a good activity to have students working with the knowledge. But then there's these critical second and third steps. The second step is what she's really been focusing on when we ask students to look at peer work and to give them some feedback on their work, preferably some ideas about how their work can be improved. And this engages a whole lot of critical thought and creative thought communication uh, at that step. But then there's a third step too, which for me is almost the, the real goal of all of this. This is a step where students receive feedback from their peers. As Chi said, it's not always great. Uh, it's not always accurate. I think that's a good thing because we tell students, you know what, your peers, eh, sometimes they know what they're talking about, sometimes not. You don't have to do what they tell you to do. 
What you have to do is think about what they tell you to do. Uh, and so we're trying to encourage that growth mindset. It turns out it's not natural to have a growth mindset. And so we can really scaffold that process, teach them how to analyze feedback, and then how to use it well to, to make their work better. Uh, and so these two steps are driven completely by the students. Active learning at its best, assessment as learning at, at its best. Um, and, and the really cool thing is students like it and value the experience. They want more of it. Uh, so it's a very powerful on that educational level, even when it's done in a sort of traditional way. But if we use technology to manage this process, there are certain other advantages. There's one that I don't even have listed here that I should have, which is anonymity. We can have students giving and receiving feedback without knowing who the, you know, who is the giver and who is the receiver. Uh, and, you know, with one fell swoop, that eliminates all sorts of biases that could be based on gender or culture. All you have is the student's work to react to. Uh, and so that's extremely powerful in and of itself. But the really nice thing is, you know, it's great to ask a student to assess one peer's work, but I like to ask them to assess five or six peers' work. That repetition of seeing multiple exemplars and being able to compare them and not only compare them with each other, but compare them with your own work is a really strong metacognitive uh, context for understanding where your work fits and for also giving you this repeated structured practice engaging those skills. Uh, so the technology can handle all the, you know, assigning five peers and then bringing it back and figure it out what, what goes with what. And that allows us to do this practice in a really powerful way that can really build the skills we wanna build. In addition, you know, uh, she was talking a lot about micro learning in her course with 1HE, which is fantastic, by the way, I took a look at it. Um, we can embed micro learning right in here. This is one of the, the things I like to point out. Our faculty have a lot of experience in their subject areas. They don't necessarily have a lot of experience in terms of um, coaching students on how to give good feedback or motivating them to do so or how to learn from the feedback. Uh, and so we can embed in these steps micro learning experiences where we explain to the student why they should care about learning how to give feedback and what good feedback actually is. And then right after we teach them, we can say, okay, now go and do it. Go that what you just learned, use it. That is a really powerful way to teach a skill, micro learning combined with immediate repeated practice. Um, and, and we can do that in both phases here. And in doing so, we're sort of embedding pedagogical expertise. Um, the instructor, if they're a geography instructor, they just have to come up with a great geography uh, activity. And then the technology can worry about guiding students through the rest of the process in the most optimal and effective and evidence-based way. Okay, let's flip to the next slide. Here's the, I, I wanna give you a taste. We've been talking so much so far about what I might call Christmas present. I wanna go a little bit towards Christmas future here for, for a moment. Um, these processes are really great for developing these skills. But you know, David was talking about acknowledging, recognizing uh, what students are good at. You can do that in an extremely powerful and innovative way with these technologies. There are now rubrics. The American Association of Colleges and University has 16 rubrics for things like critical thinking, creative thinking. These have all been validated. And we've done research showing that if, a, if you ask, say, five of my peers to score my work, how much critical thinking is in my work using a critical thinking rubric, if we average those five peer assessments, it turns out that they correlate very highly with trained AAC and U expert ratings of critical thinking in these pieces. Uh, and so you can actually use the student averages on the fly to assess everybody's level of critical thinking, creative thinking, whatever skill you have a rubric for. Students learn a lot by applying these rubrics. She kind of highlighted that already, but we can also get a number out of it. So every student who goes through, we can get a sense of where they sit on whatever skill. And then we can do things like say, oh, if you're in the top 10%, you're going to get something on your digital portfolio to, to recognize that. And ultimately students can end up with a digital portfolio that highlights all of the skills they, they're doing really well in. You know, a really nice representation of who they are and what they're good at, uh, which can use, they can use to guide personal development, but can also be used to represent themselves to potential employers um, or other educational opportunities, et cetera. So I think that's really cool, that measurement potential. One less slide to, to jump to. Um, here's the other cool Christmas future thing. 
So this is just meant to be a mock curriculum of a sort. But imagine we have instructors in these certain courses who are using this peer assessment process and they use it in conjunction with rubrics that, that get different things. And, and so let's go up in the upper right corner and say, okay, at the end of our program, somebody used a critical thinking rubric. And so we now know what student, how the students in that course scored on that. We can use sort of AI pattern analysis approaches to try to figure out if anything predicts why that student did as well as they did. And maybe we find that somewhere you know, early on, maybe Math 241, where the instructor wasn't even doing this, all of the students who did well in critical thinking took Math 241. Mm, there's something in the water in Math 241. There's something good going on there that's having positive downstream effects. Maybe we could go and find out what that prof is doing because we might want more of that in our program. So once we can measure these skills, we can now intentionally use that data to optimize the learning that we're providing and not just the learning around content, but you know, really the learning around these transversal skills that can really you know, have an impact on student success, perhaps even beyond the content that we teach. Uh, so that's what I find really exciting about that, where it is now, but also where this, this is going. Uh, and we're certainly on, on the edge of all of that. On the, we're doing the research as well as incorporating everything into Peer Scholar as we go. And it's a very exciting time for that. Um, I think that's, that's it for me. Yeah. So, oh, right. I, I was just going to mention, if you want to see some of the research on this, um, this is the paper I would most recommend. It's our most recent paper where I kind of talk about a lot of the highlights, including the measurement angle. Um, that, that should say search for Jordans. I have an N in between the E and the S. Jordans, HECO, rubric, that will get you to this paper. So if you want more information, I think that's a, a great place to start. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. That's great. Um, actually, I have a follow-up question for you. When using Excellent. Peer Scholar, do students do peer assessments of individual components or the entire ePortfolio? Okay, so uh, well, so an interesting thing is you you could have them doing assessments on an e-portfolio. I, I wasn't necessarily thinking that. I was thinking they're doing assessments on whatever some coursework was, and then based on the scores you got for the student, you know, their critical thinking, if they were in the top percent or ten percent or something, that could go to a digital portfolio, be reflected there, and allow even the person to come back to that artifact that created it. But you could, you know, a really cool thing for, for someone like David to do early on would be to have them assess each other's digital portfolios and to actually see, wow, that student has a really rich one. You know, that's the power of peer assessment is whatever you want them to understand, you show them a bunch of exemplars, some that are good, some that are bad. You push them to analyze those exemplars deeply and they leave that with a clear sense of what the criterion is, what, what they should be shooting for and, and where they sit and also some exemplars that show them, you know, the direction to go in. Thank you for that. Um, if I may, I'd like to move forward with a few questions from the Q&A panel. I'll uh, open this one up to the full panel, so just feel free to jump in. Will you each address how you assess quantitative skills and share some examples? We'll start with David. I don't know that I can share an example right now, but... Um... In student e-portfolios, we use the value rubric for quantitative literacy. There are three dimensions on it. I can't remember them off the top of my head. One is uh, communicating with quantitative uh, information. Another one is manipulation of quantitative information. I can't remember the third one. Um, but basically what we, we do is we have a team of faculty comb through a student's e-portfolio for any assignments in which the student manipulated quantitative information or used quantitative information to make a point. Uh, and so that they identify those as our pool. Uh, and then another group of faculty then assesses that uh, using the value rubrics. We have not felt the need to, to change or modify the value rubric for quantitative literacy. We find it to be very, very on target. Thanks, that's a great resource. And we put it both in the chat and also in the Q&A panel. Chie, would you like to add anything to how you might assess quantitative skills? Yeah, interesting. And I might link this with that notion of self and peer assessment and the kind of work that we have seen. So in terms of quantitative uh, feedback, uh, some teachers and learning contexts include 
the feedback that is actually quantitative. And so students might get a score of something on the teamwork skill and they have to dissect that, what that means in terms of the rubric. But of course, we don't recommend that to be just the marks or the quantitative sort of feedback going back to students. What's more important is that qualitative feedback that explains why these scores are the scores that they're giving. And that really gives rich learning opportunity for students to grapple with that sort of idea of feedback. So we don't often just deal with the marks or the quantitative feedback, but we really uh, encourage teachers to embed that qualitative feedback in terms of self and peer assessment. Yeah, yeah understood. I think the question, let's Steve, let's go to you, um, was more about assessing quantitative skills of students. So mm -hmm. we could just wrap that up and then there's lots more questions for you all. Sure. sure. Um, you know, really quickly, I think the point I want to make is as long as you can word things in a sort of open-ended way that gives students some freedom to roam. So if, if the quantitative question is, you know, what's 10 times 31, there's just a right answer and peer assessment stuff doesn't do a whole lot. But if you can do something like, here's a proof, but I've made four mistakes in this proof. You know, it could be with respect to order of operations or whatever I did. So I want you to look at this proof and I want you to at least find two of the errors that were made and, and to highlight those errors and, and you know, what should have been done. And then when they're seeing each other's work, they might be seeing errors that they didn't see. So in some cases it's confirming what they saw, in other cases it's correcting what they saw. You know, as long as students have some freedom to kind of run with it in, in a certain way, you know, interpret this graph or, or what statistical analysis would use for this experimental design, those sorts of things work really well in peer assessment. And, you know, as long as there's not, the answer isn't like 12 um, or the, uh, what was it, the end of the universe was 31 or whatever it was. <laughs> you just have to avoid those. Great points by all three of you. Thank you so much. Um, Chie, I'm going to redirect back to you for this question. What strategies do you advise for students whose background and or culture create resistance to peer feedback? Oh, <laughs> really good question. And it's actually a tricky question as well. And I think it's really important in any educational context to set a safe learning environment. Right. And because this could be quite new to students, as I said, our research shows that students often think that they're the traditional assessed and they don't have to be the assessors in critically evaluating their and others work. Sometimes they even said that it's teachers work, but the world is changing and we ourselves need to become critical thinkers and evaluators of the things that are happening. So this is something that they need to do. So again, talk about the why of we are doing the self MP assessment and really highlight the benefits and learning opportunities for students to engage with this. And then create the safe learning environment that they can all contribute to, even given the diverse backgrounds that students might come from. So often one of the strategies that we recommend to teachers is this notion of team consent or agreement that they as a team come together to core construct and so the rules of engagement for example how often do they meet what sort of values and philosophies do you agree to hold on to through the duration of that teamwork exercise and then they come back to assessing that and resolve conflict for example. So that sort of safe learning environment where people come together to agree on something and then do that teamwork together, which is something that we often see in the real world workplaces. You need to have code of conduct. We need to have agreement of how and why we're working together. So I think that sort of thing does help teachers and students in getting involved with self and peer assessment. It's not easy though. Thank you. Would anyone like to add to that? I mean, I'll, I'll just do a really quick, um, I, I always find for everything we do to students, if we spend the time to say, this is why we're doing it, this is what we hope you will gain from it, and here's the research that backs that up, um, that is really critical for everything we do, especially in the situation where you are, right? There are some groups whose educational experience isn't really consistent with peer and self-assessment. Um, and so for them, this is a great opportunity to kind of bring them to the work world as she is talking about and saying, okay, you know, you've had your previous educational experience, but you're going to have your future life 
and we're going to try to prepare you to make that transition well. Thank you. Stephen, someone from the audience offered the answer to life, the universe, and everything is the number 42. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> see, see how peer, see, peer assessment works. <laughs> Yes, this is awesome. Learning. Um, David, I have a question for you. If students are sharing their solutions in their portfolios, how do you keep students from copying and you know sharing, plagiarizing, etc.? Yeah, so students are in control of the permissions on their e-portfolios. So uh, we've got it set so that faculty can see uh, any of their students' e-portfolios, but students cannot see each other's e-portfolios unless they give uh, explicit permission. And they'd have to, the default is that students can't see each other's e-portfolios. So they would have to go in and, and flip a setting to allow. So, and we do this, right? So sometimes uh, we have students engage in a peer assessment of let's say you, it's typically not a peer assessment of the holistic e-portfolio, but it might be peer assessment of uh, reflection, for instance. Uh, I do this all the time and students just give each other permission to do that. And I always allow students to opt out of that if they would prefer not to share. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna open this question for the group. Can any of the panelists speak to the concept of single point rubric? Steve, single are you familiar with the rubric. Single point rubric. Um, I let I, others I, talk. It's not something that we often use. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. When, when I think of a rubric, I think of the purpose of a rubric is to take something like some ambiguous thing like critical thinking and sort of break it down into sort of concrete things that the student can can look for. So when I hear single point, it sounds like you're looking for one thing. So I don't know, it's, it's a new concept to me. Maybe it's just simpl simplifying the assessment um, to make it as concrete as possible so that people can be get used to that, this process of, of searching for that thing and comparing that thing. That's my best floundering answer. <laughs> it sounds a bit like competency-based uh, rubric, perhaps that, that students uh, go, yes, I can do that, or no, I can't do that as a single criteria of a rubric. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but we don't often refer to single point rubric in our practice. As Steve says, it's often a rubric consisting of certain set of criteria that we unpack uh, what that particular learning outcome or the task uh, looks to evaluate on. So yeah, David, do you want to add anything to that? I do not. We, I'm not familiar <laughs> with single point rubrics, and nor do we. Nor do I think we're they're in use at my institution. So I don't feel like I could contribute. There is a link in the chat if you want to learn more. Um, thank you, Kim, for offering that new nomenclature to the group. Um, but there's some information in there if people are interested in learning more about the concepts. And um, next question. This will be for all of you. Do you find faculty receptive to implementing self and peer assessments in their courses and or what strategies are you using to increase the adoption of self and peer assessment with your faculty? Mm, so this is for me, isn't it, Janelle? Sure. Um, yeah, so yes, in the case where there are already good foundations and practices around self and peer assessment. So for example, in our faculty of science, where there's lots of PBL, problem-based or project-based learning happening in engineering and architecture, for example, there's a lot of teamwork or group evaluation happening. So in those kind of context, yes, teachers are often receptive to doing self and peer assessment. Um, so practice-based um, disciplinary areas, yes, often we see uh, more of a incline to do this sort of assessment. But in other cases where there is a lot of uh, anxiety about perceived expertise again, um, there's less um, inclined to do this sort of assessment. But we do recommend because as I talked about lots of learning opportunities that come with self and peer assessment, there are certain contexts in which that is really fruitful for self and peer assessment to happen. So we do 
recommend in some areas, but of course the educational context needs to be there. One thing I would say though is the idea of technology that helps and scaffolds the process of self and peer assessment really helps. So as I mentioned, over the six years or so, we led this project to find technologies and we have engaged with quite a few. So uh, PMAC as part of the turning in, Spark Plus, which is another Australian um, product. Um, and now we landed on Feedback Fruit, which is a Dutch company um, from the Netherlands that really is working for us, but it's been a quite a journey. And if you look into the market of edutech in and around self and peer assessment, I would say it's still quite immature. And so in Steve's case, they developed in-house that is niche and specific to their uh, context. So I think something that works in terms of the technology that can help teachers and students in doing this self and peer assessment can really help. But it's a, it's a challenge to find what works for you. Uh, because there are lots of different variations of technologies and evaluating those actually does take quite a lot of effort. If I can Steve, just, you wanna, you, yeah, yeah, just really quickly, you know, anytime I present this, I often like to ask people, bring that prof that, you know, is hates ed tech and, and doesn't like it. Can, can you please bring them to the demo? And I like to at least get them to the point where they say, okay, I'm not going to use it, but I can understand why other people will. You know, usually once you lay out this process and explain it to educators, they get it. It just passes the sniff test and they say, oh, I can see why that would be a great educational experience. But just like she says, their worry is, oh, but I don't know how to tell students how to give feedback well, and I don't know necessarily how to teach them how to learn from feedback. And, and that's why I think it's really important to find solutions where a lot of that expertise can be embedded even as just defaults so that an instructor can worry about what they're good at and then can kind of look at the rest and, and know that it's probably perfectly fine the way it is. But if I do start to get some expertise and I want to start tweaking with that stuff, I can, uh, but I can use it right out of the can and, and my students will have a great experience and, and I will have a great experience. So I think that's part of why I highlighted that um, opportunity with technology to embed the micro learning in there and embed that expertise because some of these new pedagogies really do push the envelope on pedagogical research and not all of our faculty are, are on the cutting edge of that envelope. So bringing some of that to them and embedding it in the product uh, really makes it that much richer. I'll just add um, that peer assessment has been used at my institution for a long time. So it predates ePortfolio. Uh, faculty generally are quite comfortable with it. Uh, Self-assessment is relatively new and ePortfolio has really helped to jumpstart self-assessment. Um, we have faculty, for instance, who use the kind of iterative pedagogy that Steve uh, was talking about, where you're giving them repeated practice with uh, the same type of assignment over time, typically with different content. Um, and so we have faculty that do that over the course of a semester and then have students uh, compare their later work with the work they did at the beginning of the semester to see the kind of progress they made. And, and that's exciting. Great examples. I'm gonna do a quick time check. We have time for two more questions. I'll open this one up to the panel. Do any of the panelists have concerns about overemphasis on data and scores, um, overemphasizing the quantitative, I think Chi addressed this a little earlier, to the qualitative, or are the qualitative aspects included intentionally on the rubrics and assessments? How do you um, achieve that balance? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I sort of have two thoughts in mind. First of all, I know in the Netherlands where they're, where they're doing a lot of work, even at the school system of having a stream for more arts kind of thing, where qualitative feedback makes a whole lot more sense than quantitative feedback. You know, a dance doesn't get an 8.5. <laughs> you know, you can just talk about how it made you feel or, or things like that. So, you know, it allows that sort of rich qualitative assessment. But also when we get into the rubrics and the use of rubrics, Yes, that will lead to a quantitative value, but it's a quantitative value that's supposed to reflect somebody's subjective uh, assessment of a qualitative piece of work. 
And so where I see it, you know, I look at myself and I always used to say, I was never a good memorizer. So when you looked at my GPA of my first few years, especially, it is nothing special, man. I was sort of B minus uh, at tops, but I was good at thinking critically. I was good at thinking creatively and that started to pay off later. I, I like the idea of being able to recognize these abilities in students and to be able to say, you know, even from first year to recognize, wow, these, this student is really good at oral presentations or whatever it may be. And to give that student some sense that it's not just about how much content can I stuff in my head and then get out uh, at, at some summative exam at the end. Uh, it's a much more formative, much more rich, data rich, even though it does have, you know, quantitative, I think it is more qualitative at its heart uh, than more than our traditional approaches. I'll, I'll say that, I mean, I think it's a great question, this whole tension between the, the quantitative imperative of assessment and our sort of humanistic, holistic interest in education is a really interesting tension. You know, to take it to another domain, uh, I have found personally that if I measure my tomato plants in my garden every 15 minutes, it doesn't help them grow any faster. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, translating that to, to education, one of the things I like about the ePortfolio is that it allows essentially both, right? It, it allows you to harvest uh, assignments, if you will, and measure them and give them, you know, a quantitative number. But it's also, it should be anyway, it, a, a holistic representation of a student's experience. And so I, I like it for that reason, the way it kind of, uh, you know, threads the line between those two. Hmm. No, I echo what you're saying, David. I think that holistic as a term is a really important notion here. I think um, I sympathize with this question, great question, that I do feel a little bit concerned about the focus that higher education especially puts on the numbers and quantitative um, sort of measurement and feedback. But if you look at the rubric, and this is what Steve is saying, it comes with descriptors. So the numbers are actually coming with the description of what we mean by those numbers, which itself is a form of feedback. So I think we need to take both and more holistic approach to giving varied and appropriate feedback. Numbers are just numbers, but what unpacks that is actually the learning opportunity in talking about critically engaging with feedback. And that's also giving and receiving end of the feedback. So I think that's the real opportunity, but higher education sector normally does have that focus on quant type feedback because that's a way that students progress courses and get into different types of higher education programs. So that's the tension that we need to be mindful of. Thank you. I think we'll close the Q&A on that note and I'll turn it back over to Megan. Thank you all for your expertise and sharing your presentations today. Great. Thank you, everybody. I learned so much and thank you for your wonderful questions. I look forward to digging through the chat a little more to see what I missed. We have uh, just pulled together a follow up that we thought would be really fun and useful. So Steve will walk us through on April 14th, a demo of how the technology platform works. So click that link. It's not on our website yet because we literally did just pull this together. So kudos to my team for their work on that. But click that link. You can access the slides uh, from a previous link and we'll also be sending a reminder out so that you can register and join us for that conversation and demo. And then WCET members, we're excited that Steve is going to be our first Ask the Expert in the Ask the Expert series. And you'll be able to log into WCET Mix, the online community platform, and ask your questions to Steve and he will respond asynchronously. So look for more on that. And that is open again to WCET members. If you're new to WCET, visit our website, check us out. We have lots of great resources on our site. We archive all of our webcasts so you can see what other interesting speakers and topics we've had recently. Do visit the 1HE platform. This is a, a, an incredibly amazing emerging nonprofit company from the UK and you can sign up on their beta platform and really start digging into some of the micro, micro learnings out there. Again, the webcast was recorded. We'll send you the link, it's on our website. And we have some exciting events coming up. Our virtual summit, which is free and open to everybody, kicking off April 6th and part two on May 4th. 
and we're accepting proposals for our upcoming annual meeting November 2nd, and this will be a one day virtual event. So I think that's it. Just a nod to our fantastic sponsors that underwrite our programs and events here at WCET and our supporting members. So thank you to all of the panelists. Janelle, you are a wonderful moderator and it was great working with all of you on this presentation. And thank you to Kim and Lindsay for doing so much groundwork for this webcast and the follow-up. Again, thanks everybody, take care. Thank you very much. Well, thanks everyone.